Does the order in which you eat your food make a difference when it comes to glucose spikes? We're going to ask an expert today. Over the last year or so, I've heard from several different sources that the order in which you eat food really does make a difference. That if you eat your high carb foods first, you're going to spike a whole lot more than if you eat your low carb foods or your proteins and fats first and then have your high carb food last in your meal. So I finally decided I'm going to test that. Dr. Jason Fung recently posted a video where he asserted this is indeed true that when you eat your carbs first, you spike a lot. When you eat them last, you spike only a little. So I decided we'd ask someone who's even more of an expert than Dr. Jason Fung. Who could that be, you say? Who could be more of an expert than Dr. Fung? Well, this little fella here named Mike, Mike the glucose meter. Uh, I consider him the expert and the final authority in how my uh, foods affect me and how they make my glucose to spike. So today we have for my lunch uh, uh, something I eat almost never. <laughs> I, I consider uh, uh, potatoes as an enemy, and somebody's going to say, "Yeah, Dennis, but don't you know a baked pot? I mean, a sweet potato is not a real potato." Well, it acts like a potato, it looks like a potato, and it spikes like a potato. So. Uh, for all practical purposes, it is a potato in my book. Anyway, I'm going to eat this first, and that should give me the biggest spike if the theory is correct. And then tomorrow I'll come back and I will eat. I've got a, a hamburger patty. It's a little on the small side because it's a, a half of a hamburger patty. And then I have a salad. I'll put some ranch dressing on that and I'll eat the salad first tomorrow, and then the meat, and then finally the potato. But today I'll eat the potato first. We're going to get the worst out of the way which should create the greatest spike. If this theory holds true, I have a feeling there probably is something to it. So we will check it out, and I'm going to go ahead and start with this baked potato. And I'm not even putting any butter, which is a real sacrifice. As, as little as I eat potatoes, you'd think the one time I get to enjoy one, I'd get to put some butter on it. But just to kind of hold true to our test, uh, I won't even do that. It tastes like a baked potato. So I will see you back an hour after I finish my meal. A lot of people wonder, when do you set your timer? When do you actually start timing things? For me, it's an after I take that final bite. So an hour after I finish this meal, I'll set my timer for uh, to go off in one hour, come back and test myself, and see where my blood sugar has gone. Well, it has been about an hour, maybe a little over an hour, that uh, I finished my food. So let's go ahead and see. I, I decided to do the worst first. So we're going to see what the glucose number is. And um, hopefully tomorrow it'll be better. And uh, eating the food order may prove to make a difference. Let's see what we get here. Whoa, 179, not at all good, but not at all surprising either. I expected that would give a rise. Uh, that uh, rise came not from the meat, not from the salad, but from that sweet potato. So I'll see you back here tomorrow and we'll see if it does make a difference when we change up the food order. Well, it is one day later, and here I am back again to test my blood sugar. I had the meal, it's been an hour. Since I finished that meal, and let's see uh, if it made a difference. In this case, I had my high-carb food, which was the sweet potato, last. Had the salad first, had the hamburger patty, or half of a hamburger patty second, had the baked potato, the sweet potato, last. And I'm curious about this. You know, uh, most of the tests that I do, I've got a pretty good idea how it's going to go and whether it's going to, you know, just how high the spike will go. And yesterday, I was pretty sure it would be pretty much where it was. I didn't actually guess, but if I had guessed, I would have guessed probably pretty close to what it turned out to be. In this case, um, I, I don't really know what to expect. So we're going to find out. Uh, there was a... Uh, a documentary on, on YouTube made in Japan 
where they did some research and uh, on, on blood sugar spikes. And there was a guy named Yochiro Harita who changed the order of his foods. He had rice and some meat and some vegetables. And he, when he had the rice first, he went up to 233. When he had the rice last, his peak at the same time was 123. So a 110 point difference depending on whether he ate his rice first, which spiked high, or ate his rice last, which did not spike high at all. So uh, if that were to hold true for me, uh, I would be shocked. Of course, it's not going to be 100 points lower, I don't think, but uh, we'll see. Not much difference at all. 171. Yesterday was 179. Today is 171. Uh, kind of a disappointment, but uh, <laughs> uh, Mike is the expert here, at least when it comes to my own body. So I will do a two-hour test, and uh, I did a two-hour test yesterday. I'll share the results of that, and then the two-hour test today, and have some uh, conclusions and final remarks after a bit. Well, as the Apostle Paul famously declared, what should we say to these things? I guess I would have to say that we had mixed results. I assume that the spike would be quite a bit lower based on what I've heard people saying, but a spike of 179 with the carbs first and 171 with the carbs last, well, there just wasn't there that much of a difference. But before we go any further, let me give you all the data. On day one, eating the sweet potato first, the salad second, and the hamburger last, I had an 89 before I ate. At one hour after eating, my glucose spiked to 179. And at two hours, it was on its way down, but it was still too high at 143. On day two, eating the salad first, the hamburger second, and the sweet potato last, my premio glucose was at 95. At one hour after eating, my glucose spiked to 171, and at two hours post-meal, my blood sugar was at 100. Well, this was almost the opposite of what I was expecting. I figured that by eating the potato last, it would delay my glucose spike and that my two-hour mark would be as high or higher than my one-hour mark. I thought that eating the potato at the end of the meal would delay my glucose spike, but instead, by two hours, it was surprisingly good at 100. Whereas when I ate the potato first, at two hours, my glucose was still too high at 143. Kind of puzzling. I have to confess that I was a little bit ambivalent about doing this test because if it did turn out that food order seriously shuts down glucose spikes, some of you might be saying, oh goody, now I can eat potatoes and rice and cake with ice cream and bread rolls and so many other high carb foods. So all I have to do is just eat them at the end of the meal and I'll be good. For someone with sky-high blood sugar, that would be a recipe for metabolic disaster. In my case, I still got a glucose spike, but it wasn't quite as high, and it definitely did not last as long. Will this experiment change my life or my eating habits? No, not at all. For me, things like potatoes and bread and pasta and breakfast cereal... They are enemies of my metabolic health, and to eat them first, last, or in between, well, that would be like fraternizing with the enemy, something I am not willing to do. Is there any benefit connected to the idea that eating your high-carb foods at the end of your meal will probably blunt your glucose spike a bit? Well, yeah, there could be. If you are at grandma's house and she serves a dinner that includes some high carb foods and you know granny would be crushed if you don't eat what she's worked on all afternoon to fix for you, you could do a couple of things. First, you could eat her high carb foods in small portions. And secondly, you could eat the salad and the meat first and save those higher carb foods until the end of the meal. But do not be deceived into thinking that by eating your high-carb foods at the end, you are now free to eat whatever you like simply by changing the order you eat things. First, desserts are always eaten at the end of meals, and that never stopped them from being disastrous to blood sugar. Second, whenever you eat high-carb foods, you're stressing your metabolic system, and that is the very last thing a diabetic needs to do. 
Third, in many cases, eating the carbs last wouldn't make much sense. If you order a hamburger and then you eat the meat first and you save the buns until last, well, who would enjoy that kind of a burger? After the meat is eaten, the, those buns would quickly lose their appeal. Or imagine going to a pizza restaurant and ordering a deep dish pizza. And when you get your pizza, you scrape off all the toppings and eat them first. And then after enjoying your pizza toppings, you proceed to eat the crust of the pizza. I don't think most people would find that too satisfying. Finally, if my test is any indication, if you're going to get a pretty serious spike, even if you do come down a little faster, that spike is not healthy for you. Glucose spikes always provoke surges of insulin, which will eventually lead to insulin resistance. Or if you already have insulin resistance, they will worsen your insulin resistance. In short, in my humble opinion, the idea of food order being the new savior of diabetics fits into the category of that famous saying, if something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Adjusting your food order may help a little, but it's not likely to save you from diabetes. If you think you can go right on eating the same miserable, high-carb, high-sugar, junk food, and highly processed food just the way you always have, and that by simply shifting when you eat that junk, all will be well, you are living in a fantasy world. It would be like trying to put out a raging forest fire by hurling teaspoons of water at the flames. You may feel like you're doing some good, but you're not doing much. There are a lot of things that can help a bit with blood sugar. Taking berberine, putting cinnamon in your coffee, going for a walk after a high-carb meal, drinking apple cider vinegar, all these things can help a little bit. But if you have glucose in the 300s, 400s, or 500s, you need something far more powerful, and that is a radical, fanatical, ruthless slashing of most of the carbs and all of the high-carb foods from your diet. By eating that sweet potato at the end of my meal, it did seem to make somewhat of a difference. But here's what would have made a far bigger difference. How about not eating that sweet potato at all? How about eating a steak or an avocado or a thick slice of cheese or a couple of boiled eggs or a chaffle topped with cream cheese? Here's a newsflash. There are no potato police who are going to come to your house and check and see if you're getting your daily dose of potatoes. Nobody has ever been arrested for not eating potatoes or rice or pasta or breakfast cereal or bread rolls or pastries. There are so many excellent substitutes for high-carb foods and snacks these days. There really is no reason not to cut those carbs and get your glucose under control. As I record this, this is the 14-year wedding anniversary for Benedicta and me. And the question that so many people have about us is how in the world did you guys get to know each other? How did you get together? Well, the answer is found in Benedicta's new autobiography, When Destiny Calls. In fact, we do something in that autobiography that is almost never done. We each have a chapter sharing from our own perspective how we got together and how we first got to know each other. So she tells her side of it, I tell my side of it, and then it goes on with the rest of her autobiography. And the whole autobiography is exciting. It's a lot of drama and a lot of good stuff. But I think you'll find it interesting to know how it was that God brought us together. So there'll be a link in the description about how you can get this book on Amazon, either as an ebook or a paperback.